Hi everybody, I'm Karen Woodbury from the communications team. Glad to have you all here and those VCing in, welcome also. Um, we have a really great uh, storyteller and political reporter here today, uh, John Heilman, uh, talking about the bestseller Game Change, subtitled Obama and the Clintons, McCain and Palin and the Race of a Lifetime. And I assume all of you are listening in because uh, you felt the same way. It was felt like the race of a lifetime. And it was only a year ago and a little more that, it, that uh, things came to one kind of fruition. Uh, John uh, wrote the book with Mark Halperin. John is here today on his own. He's a longtime business and political reporter uh, for a lot of well-known publications like The Economist and Wired. Uh, the New Yorker, and now he is the national political correspondent for New York Magazine. Um, the, um, this, this book, Game Change, uh, and there are copies in the back here in, uh, in uh, Mountain View, um, has been uh, the number one, uh, it was the number one, uh, number one on the, sorry, on the New York Times bestseller list for seven weeks, which uh, is very good for a political book of this sort. And uh, John has been busy uh, touring at Mark II and uh, going over a lot of the fresh ground that, the, that the, the two of them came up with to tell this incredible story. So John's going to talk, and then there'll be a little time for questions and book signing at the end, and we'll end at noon. So, John. Thank you, Karen. It was a very loud uh, applause for a very small group. <laughs> <laughs> enthusiasm level is very high. Um, uh, thank you for having uh, me come here. Um, back to one of the many hums in my professional life. I spent four years in Silicon Valley uh, from 1998 to, 19, to 2002 writing about um, people whose uh, degree of ego and vanity and hubris and neediness is almost as great as those of presidential candidates, not speaking of <laughs> high tech CEOs. Um, <laughs> Uh, Karen is right. Um, uh, the subtitle of our book is not um, was not a, uh, a mistake. Um, a large part of why Mark and I decided to write the book was because um, though we've been covering presidential politics for 20 years, off and on, in my case, uh, full straight through in Mark's case, um, we thought that this campaign was pretty extraordinary. And in fact, um, there had been a, a, a general view about campaign books, which is that it was sort of a dead genre that people. Um, especially in an age of 24-7 uh, news and uh, the blogosphere and cable television, uh, that uh, everyone knew everything there was to know about uh, any campaign in real time. Uh, and why on earth would anybody want to read a book about uh, a campaign that was part of the past a year after it was over? Um, we, we thought that um, this campaign was different, and we also thought that there were some mistakes in that analysis of, of the news cycle. I'll talk about both of those real quick. Um, the first was that uh, you know, as I say, Mark and I have been covering presidential politics for a long time, and we had never seen a race uh, quite like this one. We thought it was the best race we'd ever covered and would possibly ever cover. Um, every uh, great story has a couple things in common, has you know, two uh, uh, features, one of which is um, great characters, and the other is a great plot. Um, and in the case of the 2008 campaign, we had both of those things in abundance, and I think part of the reason that the book has done well, to the extent that it's done well, uh, is because people are, in fact, still incredibly interested in all these people. Um, they are not um, interesting for politics, um, like John Kerry uh, or Dick Luger, uh, but they are interesting, interesting people who could be on the cover of People Magazine or on Oprah as easily as they could be uh, on the cover of Congressional Quarterly. Um, the, the Obamas, uh, the Clintons, um, Sarah Palin, of course, uh, John McCain, uh, these people continue to be uh, big players on the national stage. People continue to pay a lot of attention to them and want to know uh, who they are and what they're about and what they're doing. So uh, that was a big factor. Uh, we thought those characters would be still interesting a year after the campaign. It turns out that they, they are. Um, another factor, of course, was the plot, which was uh, part of the reason why we called the book Game Change. There were a lot of game-changing moments or potentially game-changing moments in 2008. It was a wild ride by every uh, standard. And we thought that um, that would also help us. And I think, again, to the extent the book's been a success, the characters and the plot are a big part of the reason why. Part of the reason why. Um, we also thought that the, the analysis of the fact that the news cycle was so constant and that there was so much coverage, in fact, this race, you know, certainly the most covered and arguably the most overcovered race in history, um, that that, in fact, opened a door for us uh, rather than closing one. And by that, I mean, 
you know, we had covered the race as closely as anyone, and we read all this coverage. Uh, and the fact was that, you know, the way that that news cycle now works, um, every reporter is now a wire service reporter, effectively. You're now having not just, you know, to do a story every day, but do multiple versions of the story on the web. Um, that creates um, uh, uh, enormous advantages in terms, of, um, in terms of how fast we get the information. It also creates real strains for reporters who um, are not having the kind of time um, that they once did to go back and really excavate what happened as things occur. And so you have events that, are, that take place, whether it's um, Barack Obama winning the Iowa caucuses or uh, John McCain putting Sarah Palin on a ticket. People are fascinated and obsessed with those topics for a few moments. The reporters really fixate on them for, for 48 hours, and then the circus moves on, and they have to move on with it. And so big questions, and, I, and by big questions, I don't mean big philosophical questions. I mean just fundamental questions that I think not only uh, uh, political insiders want to know the answers to, but many people who were watching this race and talking about it around water, cools and every, uh, water, water coolers and over kitchen tables would ask themselves all the time. Mark and I had those same questions, and we didn't think there were really satisfactory answers to them uh, at, in all the coverage that we'd seen. And, and I'm, I, again, when I say big questions and fundamental questions, I mean things like, how did Barack Obama actually decide to run for president? Um, how was a guy who had only been in the United States Senate for about two years, had a very uh, thin resume by any stretch, had a last name that sounded like Osama and a middle name that was Hussein, get it into his head that he could be the first African-American president, convince himself he's not a guy who's prone to flights of fancy, he's very cautious in a lot of respects. How did he get to the point where he thought he could beat Hillary Clinton, who was by every stretch of the imagination the odds-on favorite and was seen as being the, the candidate who was going to run away with the Democratic race? That question, to my mind, had never been answered, and we thought that that was a kind of an important question. You know, um, you know, what was the relationship between Bill and Hillary Clinton in the course of her, in the course of her campaign? Many people had a lot of speculative uh, theories about whether President Clinton had been running her campaign secretly, um, whether he was actually wanted her to win or was trying to in some way sabotage her. Um, some of these theories were crazy, some of them were not, were less crazy. But again, I couldn't, having even covered the Clintons, Mark and I both have known uh, both Clintons since 1991 or 1992, um, and having covered them for a long time, I couldn't give you a good answer to that question, what role did, did the President really play in the campaign. Um, and then, of course, the biggest mystery of all for a lot of people, which was, you know, how did Sarah Palin actually get on the Republican ticket? Um, a question, again, which people obsessed over for 48 hours and then walked away from. So we thought that, in fact, if we, if we took the time, um, which was, entailed a certain risk, uh, if we took the time and went back and did a lot of interviews and did a voluminous interview, voluminous interviews not only great in, in, in number, but also great in the amount of time and effort that we expended doing them, we did... We talked to over 200 people for the book. We did more than 300 interviews, and those were the, not follow-up interviews, but were the main interviews we did. We did them almost all in person, and many of them, all, virtually all of them, ran at least an hour, an hour and a half, and many of them ran five, six, seven hours, and they were like conducting oral histories. We had the advantage of, of knowing virtually everybody who we were writing about in the book, from the candidates uh, to the most junior staffers who worked for them, and, and known them for a long time having relationships with them where we could sit down with them in a kind of considered way and explain what we were trying to do, how the material that we got from them was going to be used. And there was, um, because of the fact that we knew them so well, they were inclined to trust us. And I think as they started to see the kind of questions we were asking and the time we were taking with the, with the process, they became more trusting. And they had also experienced this race in the same way we had. It's kind of an extraordinary thing, whether they had won or lost or worked for a winner or worked for a loser. They recognized that this was an event uh, unlike most of the things they'd ever done in politics before. And they became very much invested in the, in the spirit of the project, that, that there was um, a reason to try to get uh, this campaign down and to do it in the way that we were trying to do it. And I think that also goes to one of the things about the book that's a little different. I, the, the thing that, that I think that you know, we, we, we were relentless about throughout trying to do this book was not to write about strategy and not to write about tactics and not to write about pollsters and not to write about consultants, but to try to write really about these characters and about the candidates and their spouses and how going through this process, which you know is some combination of a meat grinder and a flash incinerator, how that process uh, changed them, how they dealt with it, how their uh, strengths and weaknesses as human beings um, manifested in the course of the of the campaign and how it affected the outcome, because we both believe that it really did in this campaign in particular, and in the Democratic nomination fight, even more, in even more particular, um, the differences of policy were minimal between the candidates. Um, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were not competing really on, this, on the basis of, of, of big differences in terms of how they would govern the country. They were campaigning largely uh, on the differences of vision and on differences of temperament and, and style and, and character, and and so. You know, we felt that one of the things that had been really missing in a lot of the coverage was 
was a really um, uh, an intimate picture of, of, of what this process was like in the, in the early 21st century and, and how these people went through it. And that's what we set out to do. Um, I think that you know, we, there's been, uh, the, the book produced a, a fair amount of news, um, but beyond the, the news nuggets in the book and the things that got headlines that helped sell the book for sure, you know, I think people who actually sit down and read the book rather than reading the, 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 the coverage of the book, you know, find in all of the, the portrayals of the book uh, much more um, nuanced and, and careful uh, and certainly um, uh, uh, right up close kind of a picture of all these people than they've gotten in a lot of the other coverage. And, and some of that uh, reflects badly on the candidates and some of it reflects really well on the candidates and I think all of them uh, show in the book um, the, the, the real mix that, that, that affects and afflicts in some ways all politicians between the high nobility of their calling and, the, and a lot of the, the, the personal qualities that sometimes trip them up. Um, I, I, will, I will try to do th two things um, uh, over the course of the next um, half hour based kind of on experience of, of having done a fair, fair number of these talks in the last couple months. Um, one is to talk just a little bit about the, the core of the book, which as I say is, is the candidates and their spouses, but in particular talk about uh, a handful of the relationships that are the dominant relationships in the book. And, and that again was a real focus for us, trying to, try to home in on the relationships among the candidates, um, both as rivals, as, as, as in some cases as collaborators or as, uh, as allies. Um, and talk about the, some of the surprising things that we learned in the course of reporting the book. And then I'll try to talk a little bit more specifically about Obama because I think a lot of people have asked over and over again, you know, what do we learn from the book about where he is now? Um, and the, the book is uh, kind of scrupulously non-analytical in a way, um, though uh, Mark and I both get paid to do a lot of political analysis. We tried to tell this very much as a story, just as a straight narrative. But there are clearly things in the book that if you read the book uh, intelligently, as I know anybody who works at Google would do, um, you, you find, I think, that there's a, uh, uh, there are lessons in the book about that tell you things. Things are exposed about Obama's character that bear very, very uh, d d definitely on, on his situation today. Before I do either one of those things, even though this group is small, I'm going to ask, um, I like to always get a feel for my audience before I uh, talk, before we plunge into um, to the substance of the talk. So um, I'd like to figure out where we all are politically. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys in 2008 um, who you voted for. If you feel uncomfortable voting in front of other people, close your eyes. Um, so, so how many people in the audience here voted for Barack Obama for president? How many people voted for John McCain? Okay, so that's a typical crowd from Northern California. <laughs> um, Usually I'm, I'm blessed by like one or two people who put up, uh, put up their hands for McCain and then I can say, you know, for Northern California, that's a very relatively diverse audience and offer them, you know, Secret Service protection. For me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in this case, um, let, let me ask one, one other question. On the Democratic side, how many people voted in the Democratic California primary? How many people voted for Barack Obama? How many people voted for Hillary Clinton? Wow, see now you guys, now that's a relatively diverse audience for Northern California too. So um, a big Obama crowd here. Okay, so we'll talk, we'll talk a lot about Barack Obama. Um, um, uh, I think the, 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 you know, the core relationship in the book is between, is between Obama and Hillary Clinton, and one of the great um, pleasures that we had in doing the book, I mean, uh, I have known Obama for 22 years, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Uh, as I said, Mark and I both know the Clintons really well, but nevertheless, there were a lot of things that we didn't really know, and one of the things that we didn't know, like most of the country, we observed the Clinton-Obama fight very much from the context of them as, as rivals, and, and, and heated rivals, very bitter rivals at some point during the campaign, and the conflict was the prism through which we saw it. As we started to go back, we found out about the relationship that the two of them had before the campaign, which was really surprising to us how much Hillary Clinton had been a huge fan of Barack Obama's when he first ran for Senate in 2004 in Illinois. We talk about her um, being desperate to go see him uh, before his speech at the Democratic Convention. She had heard about this kind of incredible um, political performer in Chicago. She was asked to go out and do a fundraiser for him, um, you know, stuck on an airport tarmac, uh, not able to get out, insisting that she would go rather than not, rather than giving up. She wanted to go see this guy and find out what all the fuss was about. Um, coming back incredibly impressed, telling all of her friends that she'd never seen a political neophyte who was as, uh, has as much potential as Obama, saying there's a superstar in Chicago, uh, hosting a series of fundraisers for him at her home in Washington, going back to Chicago, sending her husband out to, to do a fundraiser for him also. Um, very much the kind of candidate the Clintons historically would have wanted to support, a bright, um, progressive African-American candidate, well-spoken, um, a guy who they really felt um, the, a, a kinship to in a lot of ways, were incredibly happy when he won the race, and when he first came to Washington, 
uh, Hillary Clinton made herself very much available to Obama uh, as someone who could be an advisor to her. Obama entered the Senate in a kind of a unique way, right? I mean, he was not your normal freshman senator in an institution that basically prizes seniority. He arrived as a global superstar because of the, 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 the convention speech in Denver. He was already getting hundreds of requests to speak every week the day that he walked into the United States Senate and was able to raise a huge amount of money for, uh, for, for other Democrats. He spent a lot of his campaign uh, for Senate because by the time he won the nomination in Illinois, it was clear he was going to win the general election. He spent a lot of that fall raising money for other Democratic senators, even though he was not a senator yet, which I think is actually unprecedented in the history of American politics. He was, you know, an unusual, uh, unusually bright star, and he recognized that was a problem that in the Senate, which is a very high band institution, that trying to arrive with that, that arriving with that kind of celebrity around you was actually could actually hinder your ability to be effective. There was only one person in the Senate who had ever done anything like that that he could see, and that was Hillary Clinton, who had arrived in the Senate uh, in 2000, in 2001, with exactly the same kind of level of celebrity, global celebrity, and, and, and had had to navigate the same uh, kind of treacherous path to making herself an accepted member of the body. So Obama went to see her very early and said, you know, how do I succeed? And she gave him advice about what he needed to do. And uh, he was very much a loner in the Senate, yet totally attracted to her. Um, talked to her uh, more frequently, uh, would go and pull her aside, she would pull him aside on the Senate floor. They, they were, uh, I would say, a budding uh, relationship of, of mentor and pupil in a lot of ways. He gave her a photograph of him and Michelle and his daughters, which she kept on her desk, um, kind of prominently displayed, until the day she left the U.S. Senate. And I think that had it not been for his decision, which she considered uh, ridiculous to run against her, they could have been the best of friends. Um, but unfortunately, Barack Obama had other ideas, and that kind of drove the wedge between the two, the two of them. We talk in a lot of detail in the book about why the Clintons were so um, affronted by Obama's decision to run. But without wasting a lot of time, you know the story after that in some ways, um, uh, the, just how, how, how bitterly contested the Democratic fight was. But I think it's really important to recognize what the foundation was, because for a lot of people, the fact that Barack Obama asked Hillary Clinton to be his Secretary of State was a huge surprise. Given, and it was certainly a surprise to her. Um, it was a surprise to everyone around her. Um, it was a surprise to most of the people around Obama. Um, he had decided very early, like uh, one of the great qualities about Barack Obama is his ability to, um, to shed a rancor uh, when uh, the moment for rancor was finished. And so literally on the day after he finally locked up the Democratic nomination in early June, his attitude was, um, <coughs> all that's the past. You know, we've been, these are things people say in political campaigns, I don't care. She's really smart. Um, she's really savvy. I want her in my administration. And people around him were like, you know, are you crazy? Um, they would then ask the nat natural next question was, well, why not put her on the ticket? And his answer to them was, well, there can only, I don't really think it can work with three presidents in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a fair point. Um, he, was dead, he was determined not to put her on the ticket, was, but was determined to have her in the administration and spent most of the fall campaign thinking in the back of his mind that he would, she would either be Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense. And many of the people around Obama thought it was a horrible idea, that she couldn't be trusted, that she would have her own agenda, that her husband would be a huge problem. Uh, but Obama's attitude was, I don't care about any of that stuff. What I care about is the fact that the economic crisis is going to take up most of my first couple of years. I need someone to run foreign policy who I don't have to handhold, who I can trust to be able to be uh, America's face in the world and who is not going to say stupid things all the time. Uh, one reason why Joe Biden wouldn't have been a good Secretary of State. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I love Joe Biden, by the way. Um, but, but his attitude was, you know, this is serious, and, and, and she's a serious person, and I'm, I want to do this. And from the very first day uh, after the election, he was intent on the notion of putting her in office. And there's a, a kind of, at the end of the book, there's a, a, the last, uh, the epilogue of the book is really a, the story of the two of them and how she, who uh, Hillary does not want this job, is trying to do everything she can to keep from taking it, is totally exhausted, does not want to work for Obama, um, uh, has this huge campaign debt still hanging over her that she knows if she takes the job will be harder to repay, um, wants to go back and have something like a semblance of a normal life. And the process by which Obama convinces her, um, which culminates in a, in a pretty extraordinary after midnight one-on-one uh, -on -one telephone call where the two of them uh, sort of get real with each other in a way as human beings that, that they had never done before, each admitting a certain vulnerability, uh, a certain admitting certain political vulnerabilities and human needs that, that, that was a kind of conversation they'd never been able to have before. How she uh, ends up uh, in 
in that partnership, also with the, with the incredible uh, support of her husband, who um, on one level was uh, still furious about Obama's victory, but on the other level really thought his wife could be uh, a great Secretary of State and wanted her to have the job, didn't want to be blamed for her not getting the job. Um, how all that came about uh, is, is kind of incredible, and I think that to this day, uh, among um, all the relationships that Barack Obama has among his cabinet, um, the relationship with Hillary Clinton is as strong as the relationship he has with anybody else in the cabinet. They have worked together incredibly well in the first year, and I think the main, the only way you can explain that, both her decision to go in and, and, and the fact that they, in the end, have worked together so well, um, goes to many qualities of character that they both have, but, but also goes to goes back uh, to those early days when they first uh, met each other and, and what their relationship might have been had the Democratic nomination fight not intervened. Um, the, the, I will, uh, we, we, we kind of fancifully in the book say that the relationship between Hillary and Barack is a love story, right? Boy meets girl, boy and girl fight for the Democratic nomination, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back again. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, the, the, other, the other two relationships I'll talk about a little bit are the Edwardses, because uh, again, many people are interested in the Edwardses, much to our surprise in some sense, and then a little bit about John McCain and Sarah Palin. Um, the Edwardses, I think, were, were uh, a, a decision that when we decided to write a chapter in the book about John Edwards, not at all the center of the book, but, um, but we were going to devote a little space to him. It was a little bit of a risky decision in some sense because um, Edwards had fallen most, uh, the furthest short of the White House of anybody um, that we wrote about. Um, it was not at all clear that anyone in 2010 would still care about John Edwards, who had been off the national scene since the middle of 2008. Um, we wrote about uh, their their relationship for a couple reasons. One was that because you know, Edwards had really uh, much though uh, our minds choose to tell us otherwise um, had been someone who could have easily been president of the United States had he won the Iowa caucuses where he came in second. Um, he could have been a very plausible uh, Democratic nominee and therefore president. Um, he had also obviously been the vice presidential candidate in 2004, someone who came very close to occupying the, uh, the, the at least the old executive office building. Um, and as we did the reporting on Edwards, I think probably no, no candidate shocked us more, not just in terms of his behavior, which of course now is largely public, but just the, 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 the gap between a public uh, image and private reality. Every politician, there is a gap of some, of some distance. Uh, in Edwards, it was as great as, as any politician that, that we'd ever covered, or, and, that, and according to the people around them, the greatest they'd ever seen. And, and that gap also extended to a large extent to, to Elizabeth Edwards. And so, the story of this couple um, and, and the ways in which the things that, um, the qualities I mentioned before, talking about high-tech CEOs, ego, vanity, hubris, neediness, these are qualities that every presidential candidate has to some degree, but uh, the successful ones keep them in check and they become motivational and, and, and they're managed. Uh, in Edwards's case, they became all-consuming and, and took him over and drove him, I think, quite literally crazy. Um, and I, I, I say that sometimes when people say, well, really, is that, that seems a little harsh. And then I have to say, well, wait. You know, not the affair, because many politicians have had affairs, um, both uh, aspiring presidents and actual presidents in the Oval Office, as we know. Um, but the behavior afterwards, the, 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 the fact that so many people around him, as we report in the book, uh, from junior staffers to senior staffers and best friends, knew or suspected what was going on, tried to get him to stop, that he was in denial about how the, the risks of how this might ruin his personal life and his public, uh, his public profile. <coughs> Um, his potential to ever be uh, a serious person in American life again. Um, the, the, the way, uh, most dramatically, I think, after we report in the book, um, after uh, he was out of the race um, and uh, his uh, out of wedlock child had been born, you know, and was walking or gurgling um, um, in a crib somewhere uh, with Rail Hunter, how Edwards at that point still believed that he could be the vice president, either Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton, was negotiating very hard to get on the ticket after that, um, negotiating very hard to become attorney general. The, the idea that someone who um, had lived this lie um, could ultimately be confirmed as the United States attorney general is just nuts. It's, 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 it's delusion on a, on a grand scale. And I think that one of the things, the, the, the portrait of the two of them is very vivid in the book um, and, and, and harsh in the sense that uh, portraying someone's madness quite that clearly is, is, is in kind of inevitably harsh. But what's been most striking about the reaction to this part of the book and people's interest in it is, again, just how resonant a figure, um, or how resonant a pair of figures these two people remain for a lot of people in America. We were both surprised, Mark and I, um, in December of last year when the Wall Street Journal ran, ran a, um, a poll uh, where they asked uh, people who the most disappointing public figures of 2009, most disappointing public figure of 2009. Edwards won that poll 
uh, and collected twice as many votes as the second place finisher, who was Tiger Woods, in the middle of the Tiger Woods sex scandal. And 2009 was not a year where John Edwards was in the news very much, actually. Um, so that actually said something about how much people were still uh, fixated on the Edwardses. And I think after traveling around and talking with people about this for some time, I think I now understand a little better why it's true. And I think it goes to this pervasive fear that a lot of people in the public have about politicians, which is that they're all phony. And it, we all have that sense. We know that there's some play acting and artifice involved in politics. Um, in Edwards' case, he's like the worst <coughs> nightmare uh, of every uh, person who believes that politicians are fake in some way. As someone who's, who's represented himself to be uh, something totally other than who he really turns out to be. And I think it fuels people's fear. Um, it's like that nightmare scenario, not just for people who, um, for people who, who gave money to him, of whom there were many, uh, people who voted for him, but it, for all uh, voters, they sense that, that, that they see in him kind of, as I say, the worst nightmare about what, they, what their fear is about all politicians. And I think that's part of why uh, he continues to be um, such, a, <clears throat> such a resonant figure for so many people. Um, uh, the, the first story I said is a love story. The second story is sort of um, a wreck on a highway. Um, the third story, John McCain and Sarah Palin, we um, like to think of as sort of strangers on a train. Um, because the truth is, that the truth is that John McCain didn't really know Sarah Palin when he put her on the ticket. And one of the things that we, that we tried to do in the book was, you know, we had been told, like America had been told by the McCain campaign, that when um, Sarah Palin was put on the ticket that she had been on the short list for vice president for months and that she had received as much scrutiny as anybody else who they seriously considered putting on the ticket. Um, rarely in politics do people lie quite that baldly uh, to reporters or to the country. Um, the book shows just how uh, last minute and haphazard the decision to put Sarah Palin on the ticket is. And I, I won't spend a vast amount of time on it except to say that for most of the summer of 2008, John McCain was going to try to uh, do a game-changing pick for his vice presidential nominee. They were convinced they needed to really change the playing field in a profound way because uh, Obama's strengths uh, in terms of fundraising and organization were so great that um, there was very uh, there was a very little likelihood that, uh, that McCain could win if he ran a conventional campaign. So his game-changing idea for all that summer was to pick Joe Lieberman, um, a, the former Democratic vice presidential nominee under Al Gore, uh, a conventionally liberal Democrat on almost all matters of social and domestic policy, for much more conservative on foreign policy and, and security policy for sure. But the notion was they would run as a unity ticket and, and say they would only uh, would take a one-term pledge and serve the country for four years and try to tackle big problems in a bipartisan way. Um, the problem with that, uh, and McCain, uh, I should, it should be noted, uh, just loves Joe Lieberman, um, is a, one of his closest friends in the Senate, um, really wanted to run with Lieberman for all those reasons. And then they realized that they couldn't do it, and that the Republican uh, uh, primary electorate, the Republican convention delegates, wouldn't accept uh, a candidate that liberal. They heard from a lot of uh, people in the conservative movement that if they put Lieberman on the ticket, he would be, uh, he might not make it through the convention. And if he did make it through the convention, that would spark such a civil war that it would destroy McCain's convention and, and leave him worse off than if he had picked a more conventional candidate. So literally four nights, five nights before his deadline, um, they looked at the field and said, you know, the people that we've actually scrutinized, people like Mitt Romney and Tim Pawlenty, will not help us win. We can't put uh, Joe Lieberman on the ticket. Um, what are we going to do? And at that point, uh, the name Sarah Palin was placed on the table. Now, uh, they, they had discovered Sarah Palin a few weeks earlier when uh, Rick Davis, uh, John McCain's campaign manager, sat down in front of his, uh, his computer, and thanks to the good people over at YouTube, um, was able to discover Sarah Palin by uh, typing in the names of all the female office holders, Republican office holders in the country. Um, and he came upon a, um, a, a, a video of Sarah Palin on, uh, on the Charlie Rose show, and the fact that she uh, jumped off the screen and she was exciting, and that put her in contention. Uh, at the time that, that, that McCain, um, uh, in this last week before he had to make this choice on a Friday morning, uh, the amount of vetting that she received was one Washington lawyer, um, a junior lawyer, sitting uh, in his office for about 40 hours uh, searching Google. Um, again, thank you very much, Google. <laughs> um, do, do, doing public record searches and, and looking at newspaper clips. Now, if anybody here knows anything about presidential uh, uh, vetting processes, this is not the way most vice presidential candidates are vetted, and certainly not the way that Barack Obama's vetting team vetted uh, within an inch of their lives every single person who they seriously considered for his uh, ticket. Uh, the McCain campaign did not ever send anyone to Alaska. They did not speak to her political enemies. They did not speak to her political friends. They did not speak to her husband or children. Um, the 77 uh, part uh, questionnaire that every other candidate filled out, um, some of them, like Mitt Romney, took two months filling it out, Sarah Palin did in a half a day, and left a lot of the questions blank. Um, she arrived in Arizona uh, two night, two, on the night before uh, she was gonna first have a serious conversation with anybody, um, McCain's staff and McCain, about being on the ticket. 
um, having not met any of his senior advisors. Many of them did not know how to pronounce her name when she arrived in Arizona. They didn't know if it was Palin or Palin. Um, no one had ever had a conversation with her and did not, even after McCain put her on the ticket, no one had had a conversation with her about what she knew about domestic policy, about foreign policy. Their assumption was that she would know as much as the average governor. Um, that turned out to not be quite true. Um, uh, and they had no, they, although they had a very clear picture that she was very calm and very poised and very charismatic, they, had not, they did not really do enough scrutiny to get to the point where they realized that she had what we euphemistically refer to as limited bandwidth. Um, she, um, on the night before she met McCain, uh, she uh, had a conversation with um, his senior vetting lawyer, uh, a, a, a esteemed graybeard from Washington, D.C., named A.B. Culbehaus. Um, Culbehaus interviewed all the other vice presidential candidates in person for many hours. They did not have time to do that, so he found himself doing a phone interview with, uh, with, with Palin in the middle of the night, hours before she was going to go to McCain's ranch and meet McCain. And uh, Culbehaus asked her uh, if she had anything to tell him, and she said, well, I should tell you my daughter is pregnant. That was the first time they learned that Bristol Palin was pregnant. Um, Culbehaus took a deep breath and said, is she planning to get married? Um, and uh, there was another long pause, and he said, is she planning to get married tomorrow? Um, Sarah Palin didn't think that was very funny. Um, but, uh, but, it, but, but this gives you a, a picture of just how little they knew about this woman when they put her on the ticket. And I think um, the important thing to know from that is, you know, someone from the McCain campaign, Nicole Wallace, one of his main communications advisors, said the other day in an interview that even if you put Jesus Christ on the ticket, you would need to do a lot of preparation because no matter who you are on the ticket, you will come under relentless scrutiny and withering attacks from the other side. In order to be able to defend your candidate, um, it takes a lot of time. To, to, to know their record, to have uh, defenses mounted. Um, the McCain campaign, by being so haphazard and so slipshod in the way that they chose Sarah Palin, they did not serve her well. She was not put in a position where she could succeed. They put her in a position where she was almost doomed to fail. Um, and, to, and to a large extent, whatever you think of Sarah Palin, the ultimate responsibility for the problem here goes back to, the McCain, to John McCain and the people around him um, who, who made, I think, a terrible blunder um, by uh, not doing the kind of uh, preparation that's required uh, in these circumstances. Um, the rest of the McCain uh, Palin story um, uh, is colorful, and I urge you to read the book um, <laughs> because, um, because uh, the, some of the scenes um, in it are, uh, are quite stunning. And I think if, you, if anybody here in this room is thinking about voting for Sarah Palin in 2012, but the fact that is that none of you are, not a single one. Um, <laughs> but, if, but if you are, you would, you would, you would want to read these, the, those portions of the book so you get a sense of uh, what she's really like. Um, I said I would talk about, um, about Obama uh, for the next 10 or 15 minutes, um, and I will. Um, uh, I, I first met Barack Obama in 1988. We were both uh, uh, graduate students at Harvard, arriving there, him to Harvard Law School, me at the Kennedy School of Government. Um, uh, we struck up an immediate report uh, of standing on the steps of Langdale Library at the law school smoking a cigarette. Um, and holding a pack of Marlboro Reds as I smoked. And he walked up and said, can I bum one of those? Uh, and I said, sure, and I gave it to him. And then I said, this man's going to be the first African-American president of the United States. <laughs> uh, at least that's how I like to tell the story. <laughs> uh, uh, that was really the extent of our relationship for those for two years. He bummed cigarettes from me, I gave him cigarettes, and, and uh, now we share a common addiction to Nicorette. Um, but I have uh, watched uh, Obama uh, pretty carefully um, and reported on him for a pretty long time. And uh, he is an extraordinary, um, an extraordinary uh, uh, political talent in a lot of respects. But um, uh, there are a lot of other things to say about him beyond that. So I, I, let me let me think. Let me talk about about the things that 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 to try to answer the question, which, as I said earlier, has been asked, gets asked constantly about uh, about the book. You know, what does it say about uh, where Barack Obama is now? Um, I think there are, there are a number of things that you see in Game Change um, about Obama uh, that uh, bear directly on today. And I'll start, I guess, with, um, with his aversion to, or allergy to, uh, the, the artifice of politics. Um, uh, it, the, one of the stories in the book that I think people, again, with the, the benefit of hindsight or the, 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 the hindrance of hindsight in some ways, uh, don't remember is just what a bad candidate he was in 2007. Um, in a lot of respects, the weak link in the Obama campaign in 2007 was Barack Obama. He was uh, uh, miserable much of the time uh, in those early days uh, of the campaign. His campaign was raising a ton of money. 
and there was a ton of enthusiasm about it in the country. Uh, he was uh, formidable in those respects, and he was doing things that were providing objective metrics that made him look like a serious challenger. And yet, uh, on the stump, uh, he was uh, almost um, uh, repelled by the idea of doing what the people wanted him to do, which was to give the 2004 convention speech over and over again. And on a number of occasions, he would complain to people around him, you know, everyone wants to come here and wants to leave the room in tears, and I can't do that five times a day. Um, I, that's not the speech I can give. It's not a speech I want to give five times a day. It's not, it's not, it's not a reasonable expectation. He was missed his family enormously um, and hated the press coverage of the campaign, thought it was too horse racy, wasn't substantive enough, hated more than anything the debates, uh, which he thought were a totally uh, artificial uh, uh, format. Um, he was the kind of guy, a professorial, in the sense that he was trying to get as much information to every answer as possible. So literally a debate prep, he would say, I have a minute for this response. How many things can I get in? You know which is not uh, the most effective means of political communication. And if you remember those debates in 2007, there were a lot of them. Um, he was really destroyed by Hillary Clinton, like time and time again. Um, her uh, greater experience in this realm and her, um, her savvy about uh, being able to talk in a very sophisticated way about policy, but in a very clear uh, way, uh, she, uh, she beat him, and he knew it. Um, debate after debate, he would go out and be very frustrated by the fact that, that the, the, the format combined with Hillary's mastery of the format meant that he was losing over and over again. And it got to the point where in the summer uh, of 2008, many of the people who had urged him to run, um, uh, the people who were closest to him, started to wonder whether it was a mistake and whether they had talked him into something that he didn't really have the heart for. Um, we talk about in the book you know, Obama's decision to run, um, which uh, is a longer story, but you know, there is a moment, uh, at, at just as he's about to decide to go, um, where he has a conversation with David Axelrod, where Axelrod says, look, I've worked for Hillary Clinton, and I've worked for John Edwards, and I know what they will do um, to win. Um, they, will, you know, they know where they're going to be three months from now, every hour of the day. They're scheduled all the way out until the fall. Um, if they have 105 temperature, look it up, and they'll put in a 15-hour day. I don't think you're necessarily crazy enough to be president. You don't want this bad enough. I mean, you, you want to be president, but you don't need to be president, and that could be a problem. And Obama's attitude was, yeah, that's true, but um, I think I'd be a good president, and um, uh, I'm really competitive, and I think that my comp competitiveness will, will, will come out. Um, and and I, I want to reject the notion that you have to be um, uh, borderline insane to, to run for president of the United States. It's got to be that we can elect sane people president of the United States. A very, a very radical uh, stipulation of this party. <laughs> but I think, I think by some point in 2007, he obviously turned things around in the fall, but the, the year holds a lesson, which is that, and I think we've seen this in the course of 2009, which is Obama's, um, as I said before, allergy to the artifice of politics. Um, his desire, a noble desire, I think, to have an adult conversation with people, um, something that has worked for his, to his advantage in many settings, has been um, a hindrance in a way in this last year. And I think you know, people expected uh, Obama to be a much more inspirational figure. Um, and what has happened in the course of 2009 and into 2010, <coughs> excuse me, has been that he's been kind of in the weeds um, and, and has seemed to people much more a, a creature bogged down in, in the legislative process, stuck in Washington, not out on the hustings, not um, inspiring people in the way that he did during the campaign. I think for a lot of people that's led to some disappointment. I think his attitude towards it is this is a serious time, I need to be serious. But that disjuncture, the, 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 his kind of at times strange aversion to wanting to be uh, a, an inspirational figure uh, who uh, is, 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 is speaking with passion and rather uh, speaking with, uh, in, with in a more rational, um, empirical way, uh, has actually hurt him to some extent politically over the course of the last year. Um, another thing you see in Game Change is the way that Obama, Obama deals with crises. And, and there really were two places in 2008 where Obama faced something that looked like a crisis. I'm going to put Reverend Wright aside for a moment just because it's, it was a very kind of specific thing. The big crises that he faced um, that were more macro were in the fall of 2007, fall of 2008. In the fall of 2007, Hillary Clinton ahead by 35 points in the national polls. Many of Obama's donors and a lot of national Democrats saying, you have to change course. This is not working. Um, you're going to lose. Where you wasted all this time and money. You wasted our time and money. What are you doing here? You have to take her on. You have to attack her, kneecap her, uh, take the meat cleaver out and put it in her back. Um, in the fall of 2008, when, again, um, uh, hindsight blinds us to some of the uh, difficult truths of the 2008 campaign. There was a moment in the fall of 2008 when John McCain was ahead, uh, a week after Sarah Palin was put on the ticket, before some of her weaknesses became clear, before the financial crisis happened, Obama was actually losing uh, in the middle of September, uh, according to most national polls, McCain ahead by two or three points. 
at that moment, again, Democrats uh, around the country are freaking out. Um, you have to change course. You have to destroy Sarah Palin. You have to attack John McCain. You have to do the following things. Uh, and Obama's attitude, um, which was in fact exemplified by David Plouffe, his campaign manager, who referred to those Democrats who were complaining and panicking as bedwetters. Um, Obama's attitude was, in both instances, was we have a strategy, we have a plan, we're going to stick to this. It was well thought through, and, and we're not going to change because of the, the, these, these momentary uh, vagaries of our fortune. Um, in both of those instances in the campaign, it worked enormously to Obama's advantage. It worked out really well. I think the question today is whether uh, they've learned that, that lesson too well, whether they've overlearned that lesson. And one of the questions, again, I think it's an open question, uh, his attitude has been towards the crises uh, or the difficulties he's been facing for the last few months around health care and other things has been exactly the same as it was in the campaign. We have a plan, we have a strategy, we, 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 we thought this through, we're going to keep doing that, and he's basically put his head down. Um, you know, there, the, one of your board members, um, uh, John Doerr, often likes to say there's a time when panic is the appropriate reaction. Um, and, and, and I don't know whether this time is that time um, for Obama, but there are many people who would say that a more serious mid-course correction is required than, than the one that he's so far enacted. And I think um, regardless of whether health care passes, it's quite likely that, that Democrats are going to uh, suffer pretty significant losses in the House and Senate this fall. And uh, we'll face Obama with, a, with a, a crisis that will be greater than any political crisis he's ever faced before. This is not a guy who has had a lot of setbacks in his life politically. He's had a very difficult, uh, had real challenges to overcome as a child and in his biography. But as a politician, um, has lost almost nothing. And Hillary Clinton used to often bemoan the fact that uh, the Democrats were about to nominate someone who had never had a negative ad run against him in his life, um, which was actually true until she did um, <laughs> in March of 2008. Um, but he is not a guy like Bill Clinton or like Ronald Reagan, for that matter, who, um, whose political character has been shaped by adversity, who lost big things and had to, had to in a resourceful way, pick himself back up and, and move on and figure out how to make uh, how to find a way forward, how to improvise and, and, and make the best of a bad situation or make uh, lemonade out of lemons. I think you know Obama is uh, facing a moment whether if, if, if healthcare fails, the moment will be upon him now. Um, if healthcare does not fail, the moment will be upon him in November. Uh, and the question of whether he decides to, um, to, to improvise and to change course uh, in a dramatic way or, or, or do what he's done and did in 2008, which is to put his head down and stick to his plan, um, that will be a decisive moment in, in shaping the rest of the presidency. Um, I think. Um, what are my other Obama points? I'm going to look here. Right. Um, let me talk about two other things that you really see in the book that are um, that are, are things that, that have um, that have I think that are relevant to today. One is the the perception, and I think this goes to a lot of what some people feel uh, that are frustrated by with Obama. Um, you know, the, the perception of Obama uh, coming into Washington was that he was going to be a great change agent and was going to fundamentally change the culture and process of how Washington worked. Uh, in addition to being a, a post-partisan figure who would reach across uh, the partisan aisle and would be able to usher us into an era where the polarization in our politics was less, uh, was less damaging to, to, the, to the public good, um, there was also this notion that in many ways he would sort of sweep in and, and, and clean out the Augean stables um, in Washington. I think one of the most important things in the book, in a lot of ways, is the misperception um, that it conveys of Obama as, a, as an insurgent figure. Um, I, I, that was not actually very clear in what I was saying a second ago. I think many people thought that Obama was an insurgent figure. I think the book shows the extent to which Obama was much more at core, at, cult, at, his, at, his, at his, 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 his characterological and cultural core, is a much more establishment figure than many of the people who were so enamored of him thought. I don't say that as a, in a bad or critical way, just a fact. And I think the book, if there's, a, if there's a big story in this book in terms of news, and, and I mean historically important, it's the stuff that we write in the book about the extent to which the Democratic establishment, who everybody thought were lined up behind Hillary Clinton uh, in 2006, were in fact quietly conspiring to get Obama to run against her. Um, they had various reasons why they thought Hillary Clinton would be a bad general election candidate. And so people like Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, ostensibly neutral in the race, uh, Tom Gashel, the former Senate Majority Leader, uh, even people who were publicly supportive of Hillary Clinton, publicly endorsed her, like Chuck Schumer, a colleague from the New York Senate, were actually secretly going to Obama saying, um, Hillary Clinton's too polarizing to win. She'll lose the election. She'll drag down Democrats across the country. Um, her husband's personal life could explode uh, in his lap uh, if Republicans make an issue of the things that Bill Clinton's doing in his private time in the fall campaign. That could be a disaster. We need an alternative. And they sought Obama out. Uh, we refer to it in the book as the conspiracy of whispers, but um, he had you know, dozens of, of Democratic senators pulling him aside saying, you need to take the Clintons on. 
I think that was influential, not the reason he ran, but it gave him comfort that the, the, what was supposed to be this, 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 uh, this iron wall of support behind Hillary in the establishment, that it wasn't really true, and that there was actually more of an opening there than many people thought. But I also think it reflects on what I was talking about a second ago, which is this is not a guy, you know, to the extent that people thought Hillary Clinton was the establishment candidate, it, we could argue that Obama was as much or more the establishment candidate than, than Hillary was. And you could see that when the superdelegates finally uh, started to tumble in Obama's direction. They, they were supposed to be the, the firewall for Hillary Clinton. They ended up in Obama's camp. And the seeds of that were in this period in 2006 I just described. But this is not a guy with that kind of establishment backing. Uh, that much uh, appeal to the Democratic establishment. This is not someone who arrives in Washington like a revolutionary figure and tries to, uh, tries to burn the place down. And so a lot of the, what has seemed to be a much more accommodationist attitude towards Washington, trying to get things done within the existing power structure rather than replacing it or reforming it or, or stripping it bare, um, I think that's all very consistent with, with this, this story of how he got there. Um, the last thing I'll say is, um, is I'll, talk, I'll, I'll say that, that I think that Obama, um, when he ran for president, um, my, my co-author often very wisely says that presidential candidates do exactly what they need to do to win and not, any, not a, an inch more, you know, not, not, not an iota more than what they need, exactly the amount they need to, to get across the finish line. And in Obama's case, um, I think in the Democratic nomination fight, the, the main thing Obama needed to be was not a Clinton, and he did that very well. Um, in the general election, he needed to not be George Bush or not anybody who looked like or smelled like or sounded like George Bush. Uh, or who could be caricatured as sounding like a clone of George Bush. Um, both those things were, this is a, a kind of 20,000 foot analysis, but I think it's fundamentally true. What that meant was that Obama did not have to do something that other presidential candidates have had to do, and, and the, the two that come to mind most strikingly are, are both Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan, who had um, very uh, uh, deep and well-articulated theories of the case. Um, by which I mean uh, they had not just policies that they wanted to enact and not just inspirational rhetoric, um, but they had a view of where the country was at a particular moment of history. They had real ideologies. Um, they had a coherent way of knitting together their policies and their rhetoric and talking about in a narrative way, this is where the country is, this is where we want to go, this is what I believe the role of government is at this moment, and here's how all this stuff comes together in a coherent whole. Obama didn't have to do that. He had some really good policies, and he had obviously had incredibly inspirational rhetoric. Um, he <coughs> promised a, a change that I think you know, he believed in, uh, in terms of, of, as I said before, being kind of post-partisan. But what you didn't have was that kind of theory of the case in the middle that knitted everything together. And I think it's hurt him enormously uh, in the course of this first year and a bit. I think there is enormous confusion still in the country about who this guy is and what his theory is, what his uh, plan is and how the, the stuff that he's trying to get done uh, fits in with this bigger vision of America where it is today and where he wants to take it. And so you have this strange situation now where much of the Democratic Party is dispirited with Obama in one way or the other. Much of the left thinks he's been uh, much more centrist and much more uh, compromising and accommodationist um, than, he, than they thought he would be uh, and, and, and that they think he should be. Um, I think you have many Democrats who are more uh, conservative Democrats or Democrats who you would call centrist who think Obama has been way too much of a big government liberal. And I think part of that confusion owes to a very successful campaign by uh, Republicans to, to caricature him, certainly. But it also owes to the fact that he's not been sufficiently clear um, with people about this thing that I keep referring to as the theory of the case. And, and I think, you know, it's a, again, something Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan had in spades, something Obama has not had. And I do think that, that that for the future political success of his administration, uh, being able to be more clear and, and more precise about, 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 about what his vision of governance is and where it fits into the times we live in is something that's going to be essential to him being as successful a president as he could be, could still be, despite all the difficulties that he's faced over this first 14 months. Uh, with that, I will halt. Not stop, <laughs> but halt. Uh, and thank you uh, for coming, and um, take any questions that anybody has we here. Have a, we have a mic. Okay. Hi, uh, I thought the book was really fascinating, and one of the most fascinating parts was um, just the scenes between Hillary and, uh, and say, a close group of, of people in her campaign. 
And I'm wondering with your sources, why were they so willing to be so honest and paint the candidate in a bad light, whether it's Hillary or Obama or John Edwards? And have you heard from any of your sources regretting um, being so honest in, in, uh, in painting such a uh, negative picture of the candidates? Um, those are both good questions. Um, you know, I think I, I mentioned earlier that, that, you know, that Mark and I have been doing this for a long time, and so we have uh, relationships with a lot of people um, that stretch back a long time. And so um, that, that's the, the, the opening salvo to that answer is that, you know, um, we, we were surprised often by uh, how open people were. We did not, as a general matter, uh, or even in very many specific cases, have to go and pull teeth out of people to get um, the information that we got. We would sit down with people and say, you know, tell us about you know, what happened. And, um, and and the story sort of poured out. And so I think in some cases, um, there were probably some people who were frustrated um, with uh, what they saw as the failings uh, in their candidates, if, if it was a negative situation. And, and, and I think also that, that the way this reporting works is it's through the kind of accretion of, of, of small details. And so in a given meeting, you know, you would get, uh, someone would tell a story about how this meeting happened, and then, you know, we would know an account of that meeting and would go to the other people in the meeting and, and, and as you start to demonstrate that you know something about what happened, people are uh, both, in, 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 there's an interesting kind of human, um, human instinct to want to add your two cents to the story. So um, whether to correct things that were, that, that they thought that we had heard in error or just to um, add a small detail. and so. Um, we were relentless in terms of you're trying to talk to, in any given meeting, trying to talk to everybody who was there in the meeting. Again, from including from the candidates down to, to whoever, you know, whoever happened to be in the room was someone we tried to talk to. In many cases in the book, um, if there was a meeting that we talked about, we talked to everyone in the, in the meeting. Um, in many cases, we also had uh, uh, contemporaneous notes that people took of the meetings. In some cases, we had recordings of things that people had recorded in, in certain situations. So um, I think that people have a natural desire to tell stories. And, 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 to, and to give test to, to testify to their experience. Um, and I also have, have a belief that most people uh, tend to be truthful rather than, rather than lie. And so, um, or at least to the best of their mem memories are flawed, but uh, people try to tell the truth. And so uh, when you have someone who's decided they want to participate in doing something they think will be important to history, and you sit them down and ask them and, and, sh and show them that you're um, not trying to uh, 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 you're not looking for a particular answer, you're just trying to understand what happened. Um, the, the natural instincts of wanting to tell your stories and wanting to be truthful, I think, all sort of kick in and people um, tend to, to do that rather than trying to sugarcoat things. Um, certainly the fact that we did these, uh, most of these interviews after the campaign was over, um, shortly after the campaign was over, most of the stuff we did was starting immediately after election day. We did some interviewing in the summer of 2008, um, which we were trying to get people what memories were still fresh, but clearly the fact that the contest was over um, and that, that, that there was, we were writing for a book that was not going to affect the outcome um, had a huge uh, impact there in terms of people's candidates. And the last question you asked, you know, we've heard from tons of people who we talked to for the book. I said before we talked to, um, we had more than 200 sources for the book. Um, we haven't heard from everybody, um, but we've heard from many people. And uh, every single thing we've heard from everybody has been that they felt they were treated fairly, that we were very explicit with people about what we were going to do with the material we were getting, about how, what the ground rules were for our conversations. And people um, have come back in some cases and said, you know, that was a tough passage to them. It was tough to read that portrait of my boss, but you got it right and, and you didn't screw me. Um, and so uh, to, to this point at least, um, we're pretty happy with, uh, with, uh, with the response we've gotten from everybody involved in the book. Yeah. So what did the experience of putting the book together after the fact uh, teach you about how you think political journalism and campaign coverage could be done differently while it's actually happening? Well, it's a really good question, um, and I don't know that I have a good answer for it. Um, I, you know, like I do think that the that it's not a uh, it's not a secret that uh, that this notion that the public um, the public image and the private reality of, of candidates diverge um, to some extent, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little. Um, uh, and I think it's a, a salutary thing for voters to keep in mind and a salutary thing for the press to keep in mind as they do this, um, uh, as, they do, as they embark on do this, whatever do this is, in the case of voters, evaluate candidates to decide who they're going to vote for, and in the case of journalists, try to cover them. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know the forces that are, that are, uh, that are at work in, in 
in shaping uh, campaign coverage uh, on a day-to-day -day basis are so big um, that, uh, and by that I mean you know, the, the, the nonstop news cycle, the web in particular, um, uh, it's not clear to me how you turn back that tide. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, the thing that I would like to see um, that I don't know, I have no idea how one would engineer this, but I think the most regrettable thing that, and I think Mark would agree with this, that we've seen in the course of doing this for 20 years is that it's really hard now for, for reporters to actually get to know the people they cover. And it's a combination of the, the time pressures on them to produce, uh, and those time pressures meaning that people do a lot of reporting by IM or a lot of reporting by phone uh, or a lot of reporting by email and don't actually spend time, even with secondary sources, even with uh, by secondary sources, I mean not the candidates, but even the, the advisors around them, they don't really have personal bonds with those people. So they have all these time pressures that, that keep them from doing a lot of face-to-face -face reporting and certainly keep them from doing like long and extensive interviewing. Um, on, the, on, the, on the candidate side, the, the imperative now, I mean it's always the imperative in every presidential campaign or every political campaign, you know, controlling your public image is the paramount challenge, right? And what, has, what people have learned, um, again, uh, regrettably, I think, um, is that there's a very little upside to direct engagement with the press. And so if you were, you know, some people say, well, there's just, they're so good at image manipulation. And I, I don't really take that point of view, but it is true that candidates and journalists very rarely interact anymore. And so you can travel on a candidate's, camp, on a candidate's campaign plane for days without ever talking to the candidate. Um, and if you do talk to the candidate, he walks to the back of the plane and does a, a gaggle with, with all the reporters on the plane for five minutes and then goes up to back to the front. You know, 20 years ago, um, you know, Mark and I, you know, Mark got to know Bill Clinton by traveling around with him every day, um, you know, riding on the backs of buses and planes with him for, for, for months and months and months. And, and, and there are candidates that I can say uh, that I've spent, you know, hours and hours and hours with. And nobody gets to do that really anymore unless you have the privileged status of having known that person before and maybe you're working on a big magazine profile. But the, this huge wall between uh, reporters and candidates is a huge problem and it's a problem in both directions. I think it's a problem in the sense that, 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 that the public doesn't get as clear a picture of who these people really are. And I actually think it's, it's disadvantageous to the candidates in some ways also because, you know, there was a time, and I hate to sound like an old man, but, you know, if you knew a candidate well, you know, and you would uh, spend a lot of time with them and they said something stupid, um, you were in some cases, you know, you're like, well, he didn't mean that, you know? I mean, I, I know he didn't mean that. I've heard him give this answer six times and that was a slip of the tongue. That was not, you know, a reflection of what he really thinks and feels about something. And so I'm not gonna write that to embarrass him. I'm gonna, you know, it's just not who this person really is. I don't mean, you know, something horrendously inflammatory. I mean, like some dumb thing where he put, said the word not instead when he meant to say would, you know? Um, nobody, <laughs> nobody does that anymore. And now the game is a gotcha game largely, and if a candidate stumbles and says something in error, you know, it becomes a huge deal where everybody who's writing about it, you know, focuses on the thing and then and it becomes, uh, and they get misinterpreted more than, than fairly interpreted. All that's a, a way of me dancing around uh, the fact that I don't really know how to fix that problem, um, but it seems to me that it would be advantageous to everybody involved in the process if we could, in some way, um, get back to a situation where, where candidates and journalists actually got to know each other and there was a spirit of greater trust that didn't, uh, that didn't, didn't take away anything of the, the appropriately adversarial role the press should play in the system, but that um, got you closer to um, something that vaguely resembled truth. Um, that would be a good thing. Thanks. One more. Hi, I bought a copy of your book, but my daughter took it away to college, so I gotta get another I'll one. Take that, I'll take yours too, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I, I wanted to correct one sure. thing you said. You said nobody in here was going to vote for Sarah Palin. I'm actually registering as a Republican in 2012 to vote for her at the primary. There's a bumper sticker out here that you probably haven't seen in really? California. Didn't it's you just, say you vote for Barack Obama? I before? did. And yes. now you're going to vote for Sarah Palin? No, in the primary. Uh, <laughs> ah, strategic voting. Yes. The, the bumper sticker says, Palin in 2012, we'd love to kick your ass again. <laughs> <laughs> My question to you is more about... Uh, oh, so that's funny. You know, you've got the kind of like Sarah Palin is going to be in the very cold water. That got I don't think she's really going to have a chance in the primary. But In uh, the 2008 election, I wonder if you could just talk for a few minutes about what happened in New Hampshire. All of the polls ahead of that primary had shown that Barack Obama was going to win. He had come out of the Iowa caucuses with a gold halo, and nobody expected Hillary Clinton to take that particular primary. What do you think actually happened there? Um, it's a good question, um, and I think I know the answer. Um, that makes an even better question. Um, uh, 
where to start. Um, Mark Penn, Hillary Clinton's chief strategist, had a theory, um, which was that um, a lot of uh, the, the Clintons obviously had a, a strong connection to the state of New Hampshire um, that, that Obama never had. Obama had, had done a lot of work in Iowa, the Clintons, uh, and never had a history there. You, the, the differences between the states go, go largely to, to that. Um, uh, but the Clintons had a strong reservoir support uh, in New Hampshire, um, and that was the, the first important thing. Second important thing was that there were a lot of women voters in New Hampshire who had, for a variety of reasons, um, drifted away from Hillary Clinton and drifted largely not into Obama's column but into the undecided column. So, you know, Mark's, Mark Penn's uh, theory was that Hillary Clinton needed to get those, um, needed to reactivate those women voters who were uh, inclined towards her but had been kind of pulled either into, in some cases is, is they were saying they were pro-Obama, but in most cases they were now in the undecided column. Yet she had to do, somehow that had to happen. She needed to bring those people back home. Um, you know, everybody remembers, of course, her moment of, of emotional um, vulnerability in New Hampshire. Um, I think it, that was a big, in fact, a big factor. Um, I also think the people in New Hampshire, if you have spent any time there, as I have, um, there was a very strong sense of people in New Hampshire who, who were very sophisticated um, about politics. And the notion that uh, the, the media narrative, which was true, which is that if Obama had won New Hampshire, the race would basically have been over. I think there was a backlash to that among a lot of voters in New Hampshire who, who, who didn't want the race to end and didn't want to be part of the coronation of a candidate who would have been so untested at that point. To give Barack Obama, given you know, his, his, his relatively meager resume and his, his relatively brief time on the, on the national stage, to allow him to take the Democratic nomination having only had to, to, to succeed in one caucus and one primary, I think struck people in a very conscious way as being a problem. Um, uh, if you look at the polls from New Hampshire, um, one of the things you will notice is that, and people say the polls were so wrong, the polls were so wrong, they weren't really that wrong. And what the polls showed going into election day was that Obama had a lead, Hillary had, I, I won't be able to quote the numbers for you, but um, Obama had X percent, Hillary had Y percent, and there was you know, Z percent undecided. Um, Obama basically hit his number. Um, it, what he just didn't, what didn't happen on election day was that he didn't also get any undecided voters. So what you saw was a something you never see in politics, which is essentially close to 100% of the undecided voters went for Hillary Clinton. And so the, the, the polls actually had gotten, I think, actually got it right in New Hampshire. Um, what they did, what, what people got wrong was the was a, applying the normal predictive models to uh, to how undecided would break. Um, because no model ever predicts that 100% of my decides will all go in one direction. But the combination of Hillary's moment of vulnerability, Obama's mo moment of um, uh, nastiness, um, if you will, on the, at least uh, ice coldness on the stage when he said, you're likable enough, Hillary, both contributing to the same thing, which, which made her seem a much more sympathetic and appealing figure, especially to women voters, uh, and this perception that, um, that, 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 that the people of New Hampshire didn't want, to, didn't want to be the place where the race ended. I think those were all important factors. And I'd say, on the margin, there was some number of independent voters in New Hampshire who, uh, seeing what they thought was an Obama landslide, um, decided in a strategic voting way that they'd rather vote for McCain. And, and uh, that you know, it's an open primary. Independents can vote in either, one of the, in either one of the races. There were a fair number of New Hampshireites, I can say empirically, and I think the, the, the data actually shows this, that were actually torn, who actually, who their favorite two candidates were Obama and McCain. And they were the, you know, very centrist kind of, um, you know, they're like liberal, liberal Republican, you know, liber, liberal conservatives, or very conservative liberals, if you will, um, who on the day of the election thought, if Obama's gonna, if my vote's not gonna count, in the Democratic primary, why not go to the Republican primary and vote for McCain where it actually will count because that race was seen as very tight between him and Mitt Romney. So some combination of those factors, I think, um, were the, tell the story there. It's a good answer, and you did answer my specific question, but in particular, I, I was referring to the exit polls on the day of the election, which also showed that Obama was going to win. No, the exit polls were, exit polls were, were accurate in that case. All the, the, the actual exit, Obama was going to win? The, no, no, the exit polls didn't show that. It's not my memory from the day of the election. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, you, you, yeah, I'd be very surprised if you actually saw exit polls on that day. But the exit polls told the campaigns. I mean, the the, the, the actual network exit polls that came in were, were actually on the money. It's why Obama's campaign was able to go up and tell him he was going to lose um, long before the uh, long before the results were actually finalized. I'll take one more if you. If, if you he's he's eager. All right. Sorry, so late. Um, so uh, I've, I've really tried to understand Obama, his, his early biography, some father. 
but it, it's just very confusing. Uh, one thing, uh, so two questions up above bottom. Uh, one is, uh, there's this idea that he read Team of Rivals. He, he sort of thought, thinks of himself as, as Lincoln in the sense of uh, having come into this, you know, this sort of catastrophe in the country and, and having to, and maybe that's part of the reason for bringing Hillary in. I wonder what he thought about that. The other question is something that's even somewhat troubling is the fact that you know, there was a, a pretty well-researched book called The Case Against Barack Obama that talked about his history in, in Chicago, his associations with the, with the corrupt machine there, uh, you know, very <coughs> his support of Bogo uh, in 2006, his, his uh, association with, with radicals, uh, criminals, and, you know, and right, and all of that. And I just wondered, you know, how, how does one make sense of that, you know? Um, Somebody who knows that. Thank you. Um, well, I, the, the, I think that the answer to the second question will be a little too tendentious for us to get into right now, but um, uh, I, I, don't, I haven't read the book you're talking about, although I have a feeling that uh, it's written with some, um, or perhaps some ideological predispositions that don't make it quite straight journalism, given the title. Um, uh, the, the first answer, the, fir answer to the first question is, yeah, I mean, I think, they, I think that Obama thinks that, um, thinks that the thought that the amount of crises that he faced when he came in were on a historic level. Um, he, like, uh, like Hillary Clinton, a lot of pr uh, presidential aspirants uh, really like Team of Rivals and think it's a really great book. Um, Hillary Clinton tried to institute a Team of Rivals on her campaign. It doesn't work very well on campaigns, it turns out, especially if you're not willing to, to mediate between the warring factions and then make clear decisions uh, on the basis. If you just let everybody fight. Um, her, her theory was, if you let everybody fight, the best ideas will come to the top. She didn't seem to realize that when the best ideas came to the top, she needed to then endorse one of them and choose that as a, as a course of action. She seemed to just let people kind of fight endlessly. Um, there's no doubt that um, Obama had read the book, and there's also no doubt that he admires Lincoln a lot. But, you know, uh, I, I mean, Hillary Clinton was his rival in, um, in, in the Democratic nomination fight, but I'm being maybe a little bit too literal about the title of the book, but if you look around, I think you know people naturally kind of fastened onto that when he put her in the cabinet. I don't think he really thought of her that way in a funny way. I mean, I, he obviously did know that he fought, fought this race against her and knew that she was had, had been his rival. But um, I think he it wanted to send in her that in choosing her, he thought she would do a good job, and he wanted to send a message to the world about his bigness, you know, as a as a person who was able to move past uh, the campaign and, and pull and, and do what what put someone in a job that he thought would do the best in that job, and that, that not only that he wanted that substantively, but he wanted to be seen as someone who would, who would do that. You know, if you look at the makeup of his cabinet in general, there's not a lot of rivalry there. I mean, there are a lot of people who Obama was um, uh, very friendly with or very close to in the past, people like Arnie Duncan, the education secretary, he had a, a, a great relationship with. Um, in the White House, um, the same two of the three people that Obama actually listens to um, who he listened to during the campaign, uh, he continues to listen to. Robert Gibbs and David Axelrod are still there. He swapped out David Plouffe for Rahm, Rahm Emanuel, but again, it's a very tight circle of people within the White House who Obama actually cares uh, about their opinions. Um, and, you know, in, in the context of foreign policy, you know, again, this is a hard thing for, um, for many of Obama's more progressive backers to swallow, but I think, you know, there was consistency. Hillary Clinton, um, uh, uh, Bob Gates, uh, Jim Jones, all um, pretty hawkish um, for um, for Democrats. I mean, in, in Gates's case, not really a Democrat. You know, uh, people who who were much to the right of where I think a lot of progressive voters were in terms of foreign policy. But that's not a team of rivals. That's a team of people who believe what Barack Obama seems to believe about foreign policy. Again, I say many progressives don't uh, we don't want to believe that. Um, but uh, I think everything that's happened over the course of the first year, particularly uh, surrounding the decision in Afghanistan. Uh, suggest that those people were put into office because um, they had the same orientation towards uh, national security that Obama actually has. Um, I mean, I'll conclude by saying it's, it is, I think, one of the biggest problems for Obama is the Rorschach blot likeness of his, of his campaign and the amount of projection that people um, put on him and play, believe things that he never was. And I think one of the things that most, where it's most striking is in this area, because I think foreign policy, you know, in the end, may be the thing that it will be determinative in, in, in the 2012 elections. Um, around the time in 2011 when he has to decide whether or not to withdraw troops from Afghanistan, as he said he was going to. Um, you know, 
a lot of people on the left heard uh, Obama's speech about the Iraq War in 2002 and thought he said he was against against the Iraq War and that he was an anti-war person. And what he said was, I'm not against all wars, I'm against dumb wars. And um, it's, I think, a salutary and important thing for people who to listen to both parts of that sentence. Um, again, I, I take no position on the subject, but this is not a guy who is a pacifist. Um, and I think his appointments in foreign policy demonstrate that's pretty, pretty clearly the case. So anyway, thank you very much, you guys, for coming.